Thank you. Um, I've discovered, as my illustrious colleague discovered, probably way before I did, that if you talk about food, you get people's attentions. And so I, I've kind of backed into the, the discussion of chocolate by talking about new world foods, okay? So what new world foods please our palates? And I think lots of people don't necessarily think about this that much. So um, we're gonna start with talking about the broad sweep of uh, food. Now most people could probably say maize, corn. Um, and in fact, um, that's probably the most um, well-known of New World foods. Beans are also New World products. And these, of course, um, they, these are not wild foods that Indian people just adopted. These are uh, do domesticated foods that were um, slowly and surely developed from wild foods into domesticated foods. So um, all of these things now, the way we look at them, um, looked entirely different in wild form. And so in some ways it's kind of amazing to think about all of these foods that, they, that Indian people developed out of these wild uh, vegetables that, and, and things that they turned into wild vegetables that they, um, that they managed to uh, fill our gardens with. So corn, beans, and squash are the traditional ones, but chilies and all sorts of peppers, avocados, peanuts, potatoes. Often people are, are surprised to hear that potatoes are a new world uh, product because the first thing that they really know about potatoes is the Irish potato famine. But in fact, it was Incan peoples who developed potatoes and it was the Spanish bringing them back to Europe and then the dissemination of potato agriculture that eventually led much, much later to the potato famine in Ireland. And then, of course, in New England, we uh, maple sugar. But my personal favorite is chocolate. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is a kind of social history of chocolate. Now, I'm not an expert, so I may not be able to answer all of your questions, but I uh, do know a bit about the background of it, and I'll share with you um, what I know. So first of all, it was the Olmec people who are believed to have been the first to actually begin to cultivate and harvest cocoa beans. Kakawa is what they called it. Um, and they um, very quickly learned how to make the best out of the beans. And, and the beans are here inside of the larger fruit. Um, the actual um, horticulture of the plant is they had been around for a while, so at least 10,000 years. But it's only, we have evidence for about 4,000 years of actual use and domestication of the cacao bean. And so this is what they look like when they're growing on the tree. And then the bean itself is harvested uh, from the fruit. So one of the first things I would say about um, chocolate, and you've already heard a little bit of this, so I, I, um, I know that you, you will understand what I'm talking about, is that um, first with the Almex, and then the Maya, and then the Aztecs, the Indian cultures, the classical Indian cultures of the um, Mexican region and, and uh, Central and, and North America um, began to use chocolate primarily as a drink. Now, it, um, it's prepared in a number of different ways, and, um, but it's bitter, 
Sometimes it's served warm, sometimes it's served cold. Um, and there's all sorts of evidence for this connection to chocolate in these ancient cultures. Um, for instance, this uh, ceramic figure right here, he's holding a fruit. And in this, this is a rare page from a, um, an Aztec text, and you can see that this is the chocolate drink that these people are consuming. Um, although we don't know all of the details, the idea is that these were, that first of all, chocolate was considered to be uh, very important and consumed by the top levels of these classical civilizations. Sometimes it was prepared by priests, sometimes it was um, prepared by royal um, uh, uh, supporting staff, um, but the people who consumed chocolate were at the very top of these societies. And that's probably one of the reasons why we know a bit about it, because the, the, um, the kinds of memorials to drinking chocolate are all around the various important people at the top of these societies. Um, so chocolate basically follows the movement of these ancient people. Um, the, the, as I said earlier, the Olmec uh, gave this uh, part of their culture to the Maya. Um, they called this shawatol. Um, consumption of cocoa beans among Mayan society um, was primarily in the form of an unsweetened drink made from the ground beans. Eventually, there was a process where beans would be roasted and ground. So I s suspect that across um, these various cultures and across time, tastes for this drink probably shifted. One of the things that was at the basis for most of the consumption of this drink is the belief that it was healthful. It was a, um, an aphrodisiac, um, considered to be something that uh, was really important. Uh, but also it was, um, eventually, the um, assumption was that you would drink this for medicinal purposes as well. So it was important for rulers to maintain their health, and that's probably one of the major reasons why uh, they drank it, that, and it became a very valuable product. Beans themselves became important commodities in these societies. Um, they were both used as means of payment, and they were also used as units of calculation. So the importance of these beans um, is really um, obvious. So for instance, um, as both local and international meaning crossing uh, the, the, um, the, nation, the Indian nation's lines, uh, currency, uh, a turkey could be bought for 200 beans or a tomato for three beans. Um, later on, when the Aztecs adopted the social practice of chocolate drinking, and they also adopted its usefulness as currency as well. So you can sort of see that the importance of these chocolate beans is really uh, something that's maintained. Um, ancient Mexicans believed that the, the goddess of food and the goddess of water were both guardian goddesses of cocoa. So this was not only just a healthful drink, it was also a spiritual drink. And since the leaders of these societies were also considered divine, that's probably another reason why uh, drinking chocolate is so important. So the Aztecs called chocolate, cuck, I'm going to have trouble pronouncing this, cacahuatl, meaning warm or bitter liquid. Chacuatl is, um, in, in, their, in the way in which they prepared it, was flavored with a whole variety of local spices. They used chili, they used cinnamon, 
they used musk, they used pepper and vanilla, and sometimes the drink was even thickened with cornmeal. They also, over time, experimented with preparation methods, including warming the chocolate, um, and it could be served either warm or at room temperature. And it's not clear whether this was a drink that was entirely prepared by women, but often when you see the images of the preparation, it's women that are doing the preparation, and it's often the men who are doing the consumption. Um, and I think that that is indicative of these societies. Women are the, the uh, farmers, and in the case of the Aztecs especially, uh, men are the leaders of, the, of their society. So, um, so I think it's a, in many ways, this is a gendered drink, especially in uh, this period. So the variety of products that get combined with cocoa beans and made into these drinks is really kind of amazing. And although I've never tasted chocolate flavored with chilies, I can imagine it might be a really interesting and spicy concoction. Um, I suspect the inclusion of corn might have sweetened it a little bit. Um, and of course, the inclusion of vanilla might have had a, another kind of interesting um, uh, permutation as well. So it's not as though they used chocolate and, and never experimented with it. It's clear that there was all kinds of taste experiments that were going on. And, and of course, this goes way beyond chocolate, but I think that in the case of chocolate, uh, it's, it's a really interesting kind of history of the way in which uh, food develops among human beings. Um, and of course, in their case, it's happening at the top of their society. Now, a number of different utensils develop around the, the um, making of the drink. As I said earlier, at some point, they began to roast beans. And then those beans, as you can see over here, get uh, ground into a kind of powder. As you can imagine, it would be a rough powder. So it's not, don't imagine that you would be drinking something that, that would be smooth because the, the ground up chocolate wouldn't, or rather co uh, cocoa beans, wouldn't necessarily be ground down into really fine powder. The, um, and instead, it would be ground into probably something more of the consistency of cornmeal, for instance. Um, and one of the things that um, also it begins to happen um, probably among the Aztecs and certainly later on in the Mexican, um, on the Mexican plateau, is frothing the drink. So, and I think that that kind, of, kind of goes along with the warming of the drink because they would take these wooden bowls like this, pour the drink into it, and then with the use of a device like this, um, I don't know if you've ever seen one of these, but a molinolo, molinolo, um, and you basically, as you can see right here, she's holding one of these in the bowl, and then she's twisting it, and these, um, along this stem, these are loose, and so they're twirling, and that frothes the froths the chocolate. So what you have then, and you can see it in the bowl right here, is a uh, probably a, a, a lukewarm, very bitter, but frothy kind of drink. So I guess in a way you could think of this as kind of like an unsweetened latte made with chocolate, right? Um, so this is really the um, kind of drink that um, that, that's being consumed when the Europeans arrive um, in the New World. Now, Christopher Columbus is said to have brought back the first cacao beans to Spain, but um, Ferdinand and Isabella didn't think very much of them, and so not much happened. 
Um, in fact, uh, I read one account where uh, Columbus, and, and this would have been, I think, in his, his uh, last voyage to the New World, the fourth visit, they came across a trading canoe that was loaded with, um, with the cocoa beans. And so they brought quite a few of them back, but I suspect that they didn't really know what to do with them. And, and given the fact that by then, uh, the notion of conquest and the desire and the knowledge of the wealth of the New World probably overwhelmed them. Um, and so uh, cocoa beans don't really uh, rise to any level of, of interest right away. Um, Columbus himself tasted um, chocolate that last voyage, and um, so he, it may be that he tried to um, influence the king and the queen to think of it as a really interesting product, but uh, again, as I said, they weren't particularly interested. Uh, so then, the, what kind of changes that dynamic is the uh, conquest of the Aztec by Hernando Cortez. When that, um, in 1529, when the Spanish overwhelmed Montezuma and um, began to uh, loot, basically, the, um, the very Tenochtitlan and the various Aztec centers that they had captured, among the gold and the silver and the jade and the other things that they were taking away, they also started taking away sacks of cocoa beans because that was part of the wealth of the realm. And so Cortez, again, as Columbus had tried, brought the beans back and began to try and interest Europeans uh, in drinking the cocoa but it didn't really catch on um, very quickly. And it wasn't until a group of Dominican friars began, actually brought back a person or people that knew how to prepare the drink and then offered it uh, in 1544 to the court, to the Spanish court. And once it was prepared and they consumed it, that changed everything. And I've, I've read a couple of different places that this is true, although it's, there's other places where it's disputed, but there was some discussion that these Dominicans, to make the, the um, chocolate more palatable to the monarchs that they were serving it to, they added sugar to it. So it may well be that this first serving of cocoa was really cocoa, was sweetened chocolate as opposed to um, the bitter chocolate or the cho chocolate spiced with chilies or vanilla that, that, um, these, peop the, that these Indian people would have um, prepared. Now, one of the things that these... Uh, uh, the um, Kechi Maya did was they brought beaten kogo that they then mixed and, and served. And so there was a kind of relationship then that was implied by this serving of the kogo. And I think that that's a really important aspect of these exchange, these new world, old world exchanges. From the point of view of the Spanish, they were the pinnacle of civilization, and the people that they conquered were not. And although sometimes when I think about this, I think it's kind of amazing, really, that Cortez would have um, marched into Tenochtitlan, for instance, and, and laid eyes on the magnificent temples and the, and the stone buildings and the floating gardens and all of the beautiful architectural um, um, aspects, the ball courts with athletes playing, all of the things that would have probably had the same parallels in the, the old world, and yet he didn't see the he didn't see the equalness of the people that he met with, and and the Spanish continued to have this attitude of superiority towards. Uh, them. So I suspect that this serving of the cocoa was seen as 
less as a gift from the new world and more as a supplication from newly conquered people. However, that didn't really change at the new acceptance and attitudes towards, um, towards uh, chocolate. So Spanish nobility began to uh, adopt cocoa. Um, they replaced chili spice with sugar and they kept the cinnamon and it made the bitter drink much better to their liking. Um, they also began to serve it warm. So it begins to taste and be much more like what we think of as, as um, cocoa. According to uh, the true history of chocolate authors Sophie and Michael Coe, the most likely scenario for the development of the word chocolate in English is that the, Span the Spaniards combine the Maya word choco, meaning hot, and the Aztec word adol, um, meaning water, to produce chocolate. Um, the, again, the, the sort of semantics of this are, are debatable, but the spread and the interest in chocolate is not. So what you begin to see is this um, broader interest in the, the spread of cocoa throughout Europe. And of course, combined with the um, early spread of sugar and other spices, this means that um, cocoa begins to rival coffee in some places. So at the beginning of the 17th century, an Italian traveler, traveler Antonio Carletti, discovered chocolate in Spain, and he takes it to Italy, where a chocolate mania just developed. Chocolatieries began to open in all of the major cities. And then, from Italy, it spreads to Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. In 1660, Spanish Princess Maria Teresa, there she is right there, um, gave her fiance, Louis XIV, an engagement gift of chocolate. So this may be the first time that chocolate, the drink, and chocolate, the aphrodisiac, gets connected to romance. I don't know, but it seems like it's a good, good possibility. And not only did she give him this, this gift of chocolate, but she had it packaged in an elegant, ornate chest as well. So it's not a heart-shaped box, but it's still a pretty fancy uh, gift. Their marriage, the, the marriage of, of these two monarchs, is symbolic of the marriage of chocolate in the Spanish Franco culture. The word of chocolate spread throughout Europe, and the French um, were as crazy for it as um, everyone else. But it, it had become, now become fashionable. So you can see that, for instance, um, in a lot of the uh, paintings of the period, you can see people um, drinking chocolate. There are some um, art pieces that show the inside of these chocolate drinking houses. And so there's lots of evidence that this, this um, spread is ha happening um, pretty much throughout, at least throughout Western Europe. By the middle of the 17th century, chocolate is widely believed across Europe to have medicinal properties. So I suspect some of this is, you know, things that had been absorbed from earlier beliefs, but it's interesting because, uh, again, it becomes kind of the, and it had always been, but it becomes the drink of the upper classes. So in Europe, it's the nobility that are drinking chocolate. Um, the first official statement about chocolate is um, made by the brother of Cardinal Richelieu, uh, Buenaventura de Aragon, um, and he describes the use of chocolate as stimulating the healthy functioning of the spleen and other digestive functions. So you would eat chocolate, it, and I mean, the idea of chocolate evolving into a dessert 
It makes perfect sense in this context because you would eat and then you would, eat, you would drink the chocolate and that would help the digestive process. Chocolate first became fashionable in London when it was introduced by a Frenchman who opened the, the first chocolate beverage house that was going to compete with the coffee houses that were already popular. It's still expensive. Chocolate remains a beverage for the elite. The English used, I'm sorry, the English um, developed several changes in the preparation of drinking chocolate, uh, which changed it again. So instead of uh, preparing chocolate with water, it's prepared with milk. Some preparations called for Madeira wine, and some even included beaten eggs. And at the same time, chocolate is also now being incorporated into baked goods. So chocolate cake is uh, something that is uh, beginning to develop. As a, as a, you know, so the whole idea of chocolate, not just as a drink, but also as something that you would consume, is um, happening. Uh, Louis XIV gave a chocolate monopoly of the Paris chocolate drink trade and the French royal court to David Chaloux, a baker, who began to experiment with chocolate in biscuits and cakes and uh, the way in which chocolate could be used to flavor other kinds of baked uh, desserts. In England, a 17th century diarist, Samuel Pepys, noted in his journal that he'd been to a coffee house, but he had instead drunk chocolate, and that it was very, very good. By the end of the 17th century, the American Physician, which was a, a journal, featured a medicinal recipe using milk in drinking chocolate. Sir Hans Sloan brought a cacao tree specimen back from Jamaica to England in 1689. He believed that chocolate, as it was prepared in Jamaica, was, was um, therapeutic, and it was more therapeutic because the drink was so bitter. And yet, he couldn't get people to drink it unless he boiled the beans in milk and sugar. And so he basically, through the process of trying to convince his clients that this is a good thing to consume for their health, he created the first milk chocolate drink. Um, his recipe um, in England began to pass, be passed from hand to hand, and eventually apothecaries adopted it and sold it, and it was marketed um, as the product that was called Sir Hans Sloan's milk chocolate. So you begin to see the process of how chocolate goes from this bitter powder that's not, very, that's not ground very fine to these more sophisticated uh, usages. But throughout this whole time, we're really talking about the fact that it's only the upper echelon of societies that are consuming chocolate. By the end of the 17th century, Solid chocolate was introduced in the form of pastels, small uh, pieces. One reference states that the English ate solid fingers of chocolate in the Spanish fashion. So it's probably something that emanated first in Spain and then began to spread, although I, I didn't find any direct references to it, um, this happening in Spain. Throughout the 18th century, drinking chocolate expanded worth worldwide among the uh, elite. Chilies completely disappeared as an ingredient, except for in Mexican mole sauces. It was the only place it stayed. Massachusetts sea captains brought back cargoes of cocoa beans, and Boston apothecary shops advertised and sold chocolate imported from Europe. So suddenly, chocolate went from being a new world product to being an old world product. And then the Industrial Revolution happened, and that changed chocolate manufacture and dis distribution forever. Dr. Joseph Fry of Bristol, England, employed a steam engine to grind cocoa beans 
which made the powder much finer and uh, obviously speeded the process and probably parallels what uh, we were talking about earlier in terms of the whole um, uh, substitution of machine labor for uh, individual uh, human labor. Um, that invention, the steam engine to grind cocoa beans, led to the manufacture of chocolate on a factory scale. Irish chocolate maker John Hannon imported, imported cocoa beans from the West Indies to Massachusetts to refine them with the help of an American Dr. James Baker. The pair built the first chocolate mill in America, and by 1780, the mill was manufacturing Baker's semi-sweet and unsweet chocolate. Shortly thereafter, the pioneer of Swiss chocolate making, Francois Louis Callier, opened the first Swiss chocolate factory on the same kind of model. So you begin to see the, um, the expansion of machine-mediated chocolate. And of course, you know what's going to happen. The price of chocolate is going to uh, come down because the price of labor is no longer quite as expensive. Overall, the Industrial Revolution enabled mass production of chocolate. It reduced its costs and it spread its popularity more broadly. In the middle of the 19th century, Joseph Fry's grandson, Francis Fry, then head of the family firm, J.S. Fry and Sons, the uh, makers here, um, discovered a way to mix some of the cocoa butter that had been taken out back into the chocolate, the cocoa powder, added sugar, and then created a paste that could be put into molds. And so this is the beginning of chocolate bars, right? Um, Fry called this eating chocolate as opposed to drinking chocolate, chocolat délicieux à manger. This was the first modern chocolate bar that we're talking about right here. So um, the Cadbury brothers, not to be left behind, adopted and sold a very similar product within just a few years. So Cadbury's producing cocoa, but they're also, the Cadbury brothers are also producing chocolate bars. Both, biz, both the Fries and the Cadbury's displayed chocolates for eating at an exhibition in Bingley Hall in Birmingham, in England, during Prince Albert's exposition. This was the first time that Americans, generally speaking, were introduced to bonbons, chocolate creams, hard candies, also known as boiled sweets, and caramels. And of course, all of that was a revelation to them, and it came back to the United States uh, with them. And Americans now entered the fray of making chocolate and competing for uh, the, the um, model the, the, uh, for, the, um, for the market of chocolate. Girardelli, who imported beans from Peru to San Francisco, uh, had done so to sell chocolate drink to gold prospectors to who, you know, the, the, the um, gold strikes had happened. And he, in the process of, of his manufacturing, discovered how to extract cocoa butter from ground cocoa to create a very soluble cocoa powder. Now it could be easily mixed with water or milk. And so you could literally buy the cocoa powder and produce your own chocolate drink, which, again, was another revelation for ordinary people. And as um, these kinds of products began to be uh, manufactured in, more, in, in, more, in wider ways, uh, what happens then is uh, sort of middling people begin to uh, consume chocolate. Not in broad, uh, not a broad expanse of them, but certainly chocolate begins to trickle down, so to speak, uh, into, uh, out of the elite classes and into the, into the um, middle classes. And of course, the chocolatiers, the people who were producing chocolate, also began to try to find ways to market chocolate more and more widely. So in England, for instance, Richard Cadbury created the first 
known heart-shaped candy box for Valentine's Day. And so chocolate and romance are married, and um, chocolate becomes an important um, combination. And I think it's not lost, and, and we've already heard this, uh, that romance, aphrodisia, chocolate, Valentine's Day, all of that comes together into a nice wrapped uh, kind of, of um, gift idea. The creation of condensed milk and its addition to chocolate formed the basis for Daniel Peter and Henry Nestle's Nestle Company, which eventually became one of the world's largest producers of chocolate. In the meantime, the Swiss had developed the method of conching, which is a kind of uh, process where chocolate is heated and then rolled and it refines the chocolate to a very smooth consistency. So this is really, when you eat chocolate now, for instance, if you ate one of the chocolate pieces that were uh, there for dessert, the chocolate melts in your mouth. This is really the process that creates that melt in your mouth kind of chocolate. Um, and of course, this propels Nestle's company uh, into, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this propels chocolate into the major um, uh, world market for these kinds of, of uh, treats. The result from this new method, well, um, the chocolate was smoother, creamier, and um, as I said, melt in, in, in your mouth consistency. At the end of the 19th century, Milton Hershey um, incorporated all of these ideas and all of these desires and the marketing aspect of all of this and created a modern mass production uh, process that made chocolate affordable to everyone or most people. He also created a model factory town, Hersheyville, which was dedicated totally to the production of chocolate. And of course, their key specialty was the chocolate kiss. So by the turn of the century, the stage is set for making chocolate treats affordable for almost everyone. But it was World War I that really brought attention to the candy bar, like this, uh, like the Hershey's candy bar. The US Army Quartermaster Corps commissioned various American chocolate manufacturers to provide 20 to 40 pound blocks of chocolate to be shipped to the quartermaster bases. And then the blocks were chopped up into smaller slices, and those smaller slices were distributed to the doughboys in Europe, all of whom came home from Europe with a taste for chocolate candy and for chocolate bars in particular. Eventually, of course, the task of making smaller pieces was turned back to the manufacturers, and by the end of World War I, the returning doughboys could purchase chocolate bars in the stores, and that's something that uh, would become much more uh, widespread. Throughout the 1920s, candy bar manufacturers became established throughout the United States, and as many as 40,000 different types of candy bars appeared on the scene over the course of that decade. The 20s also became the decade that was probably the highest point in the consumption of these kinds of real, really decadent uh, forms of, of chocolate bars. Probably the reason why that retracts a bit is because the depression kind of overlays chocolate manufacturer, especially chocolate candy manufacturer. However, chocolate became part of the regular rations for American GIs in World War II. And, um, when these uh, soldiers, were, especially in Europe, when these soldiers were sent as part of the um, uh, war in, in, uh, um, yeah, on the, on the uh, European front, candy bars became kind of a currency for um, getting girls' favors. So stockings were important, but candy bars were really good. So. All of this kind of culminates into a major kind of um, desire for chocolate, taste for chocolate, um, consumer and cultural ideas converge. And so there's uh, today, 
annual world consumption of cocoa beans averages approximately 600,000 tons, and per capita chocolate consumption is on the rise. Fusion cuisine of our, our 21st century um, has logically found its way into chocolate. Um, exotic spices such as saffron, curry, and lemongrass are now commonplace in chocolates, in, in specialty chocolates, as are everyday kitchen foods such as basil, goat cheese, and olive oil. Most appropriately, chocolate has returned to its Mesoamerican roots. Many artisanal chocolatiers now offer some version of an Aztec chocolate, spiced with the original New World flavors of chili and cinnamon. Um, the market has seen major growth in organic and kosher brands, and a high percentage of cacao chocolate is recognized as a functional food, delivering, among other things, antioxidants. And so, I'll end with the fact that it seems that the Aztecs were absolutely right about the healthy products, pro healthy properties rather, of chocolate. And so, I think we can safely consume it <laughs> and feel good about that. Thank you. <laughs>